Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Arter Rogers, Emily Schlichting, and United States Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Hello, Secretary Sebelius. Hello, Arter. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you Hi, doing? everybody. How are you? First of all, we just wanted to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us today. We know that you have an incredibly busy job, and so we're just thankful that you're taking time to talk with us today. Um, I guess we really want to thank you for not only being there to push and pass health care reform, but implementing health care reform as well. Um, I know thinking about our generation, um, we definitely benefit from two major provisions of the Affordable Care Act. One is the dependent coverage, where I know my parents are excited that I can stay on their plans to, I'm 26, <laughs> and um, also making sure that college plans um, come under the consumer protections under the Affordable Care Act. So we are so excited to have you here today. Absolutely. So during this little Q&A that we're about to embark upon, we'd like to talk about young people in healthcare because I think as a lot of people in this room know, just because you're young doesn't mean you don't need to care about your health or that you don't get sick. Um, and as we all had the pleasure of hearing earlier today, President Clinton highlighted some of the ways that healthcare is working for Americans. However, uh, not all of America wants it to. Uh, and so that leads us into our first question for you, which is with a divided Congress, how can HHS use its own authority to improve Americans' health? Well, the great news is that the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. And so we are implementing the law of the land and letting people take advantage of the benefits. Um, as Artier and Emily have already said, uh, you know, one of the provisions that hit this year is allowing young adults to stay on their parents' plan up to the age of 26, a really big deal. I'm the mom of 20-somethings. Our older son went to law school, uh, didn't have health care with that transition out of college. Our younger son, well, we're not quite sure what he was doing, but it didn't come with health care either. Um, but, you know, that, that's changed, and that's really good news. And we know about 600,000 uh, young adults are already enrolled in their parents' plan, probably up to a million and a half people can do that. So a step at a time, we're putting the provisions in place, and I think that's, that's really good news for a lot of Americans who now can take advantage of the plan. Parents with kids with pre-existing health conditions no longer have to worry about the fact that their children will be blocked out of their insurance policy. That took place in 2010 also, and I know that's a big step forward. So we're, the Congress is continuing to peck away and pick away, but frankly, until they would be able, which I hope is never, to repeal the bill and have the President, President Obama, sign that repeal, this is the law of the land, so we're going to implement the law and make sure everybody has an opportunity to have health care in this country. And I know we're all excited about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess just looking at the theme of this conference being um, making truth power, what can we as young people do to educate our peers about the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think there's um, a lot that you all can do. Uh, first of all, I think the, the strategy that worked really well in the 2008 election cycle is exactly what we need. People learning the facts and then really doing a door-to-door, -door, household to household community-to-community -community education plan. Great website, healthcare.gov, that actually gives facts and figures, gives a timeline for the implementation, tells you what's available now and what's coming, and also has a whole lot of information about the insurance market that people never had before. So it, it gives very good facts and figures. You all are capable, and I know worthy, uh, to be terrific health ambassadors, uh, promoting what's real and really pushing back hard on the, on the lies and mistruths. A couple hundred million dollars has been spent during the course of the debate, telling people things that were never going to be in the law in the first place, trying to scare seniors and small business owners. So I think the more that you know about the law and the more you tell people, that's just not true. 
You know, there really aren't death panels in the law. There are improvements for Medicare. There are improvements for young people. Uh, you know, this is what will happen and what won't happen. That's really, really helpful on a one-on-one -on -one basis to just be health ambassadors. That's, I think that that's so, uh, I guess, pertinent that you say that because that's definitely something that earlier in his speech President Clinton really highlighted was sharing the truth that you know with the people that you know so that people have the right information. I, I, I love that you guys both highlight that same point. I think it really speaks a lot. Um, and kind of, I guess, to follow up on our Tara's question, uh, being those, um, those health care ambassadors, what is at stake for young people if we don't become involved in the health care debate and we don't become those health care ambassadors? Well, I think one of the major laws that passed 46 years ago, long before you all were born, uh, was <laughs> Medicare and Medicaid, which put a framework together uh, for the poorest Americans and for seniors in this country that said, you know, you have a guaranteed right to health care. You make it to 65 in this country and you shouldn't go bankrupt. You shouldn't lose your house. You shouldn't uh, lose your kids' assets because of a health incident. At the point that Medicare was passed, about 70% of adults had no health insurance uh, as they went into their senior years. So you are now on the brink of that same promise made to the rest of the country. That's what the Affordable Care Act says is everyone in this country should have the assurance that you have affordable available health care, that you shouldn't lose your house, that you shouldn't go bankrupt, that it shouldn't depend on what state you live in or what employer you work for or whether you're a male or a female. I mean right now women are more likely to be uninsured and underinsured, less likely to have all of the services covered. So if you're in this audience and you're a young woman you have more at stake in this bill than, frankly, the guys who are sitting at the table with you because you're more likely to pay more and get less out of the current market. So we're on the verge of that promise being delivered to the entire country. And I hope you'll join this battle because it's about you and your future and about your kids' future to turn this corner once and for all in America and make sure that every single person has the right has the opportunity to have affordable, available health care now and into the future. That's a really big deal. Yes, you need to applaud yes. for that, and then you need to go out and work right, for that. Everyone, bring it up. That's right. The snaps. You bet. And you know, you really highlighted a point that a lot of people don't think about how this really is delivering on a promise for everyone. And you talked about um, how women can benefit a lot from this bill. And just thinking about our, uh, our generation, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the political affiliation that a person may, a young person may be uh, swayed to, we all seem to have this passion about equality for all. So what are some of the steps that the administration is taking to ensure that all Americans have access to care that they need regardless of race, gender, and sexual orientation? Well, it's a great question. Um, I talked a little bit about women, but a, a little finer piece on that snapshot. Right now, in the insurance market, um, women are likely to pay 15 to 20% more for identical coverage. Uh, plans are less likely to have birth control coverage than they are to have Viagra coverage. Makes not a lot of sense. Um, oh my God. They are uh, <laughs> likely not to have maternity coverage at all. Uh, so that women pay out of pocket a lot more. And insurance companies right now, by law, can exclude women from policies or can exclude services for women. That will change with the Affordable Care Act. That will no longer be the law of the land. And that's a big, Almost big step one. forward. <laughs> Same thing happens with the LGBT community, that we know that a lot of the health needs are not being met. Uh, we're not even collecting accurate health data uh, for needs that folks have in the LGBT community. So we have done a lot at um, the front line of one of the agencies dealing with this issue. We started with a lot of administrative changes. So changing the laws for hospital visitation. It's no longer okay for hospitals to pick and choose who gets to come into a person's room at the end of their life or when they're in a health emergency. The patient gets to designate who their family is and who their loved ones are. 
Uh, if you want to get paid by Medicare, that yeah. rule has changed. It's very big deal. Uh, we've changed, we've listed the HIV AIDS travel ban. It used to be that um, up until six months ago, if you were um, confirmed with HIV AIDS, you could not travel into the United States. You didn't get a legal visa in order to travel. That's now gone. So we now have lifted the travel ban, lifted the stigma that goes with it. Uh, we're moving um, into an era where we have a lot of new domestic strategies on dealing with folks with HIV AIDS, but also uh, testing protocol and outreach protocol. We're at the forefront of dealing with the anti-bullying initiative throughout our schoolwork and behavioral health services, and really moving to the point where we're not only going to start collecting important health data, but that will allow us to do a lot more research uh, for the LGBT community. A really big step forward. So not only does the Affordable Care Act create a marketplace, create Medicaid coverage for a lot of folks who couldn't get it, uh, but also make sure that there is affordable health coverage uh, for um, AIDS and HIV positive patients, because here's the deal. Insurance companies right now in the current market can pick and choose who gets coverage and who doesn't. If you have a pre-existing health condition of any kind, uh, you can be legally locked out of the insurance market for the rest of your life. That is coming to an end, and that is a huge step forward for all of America. Uh, and then this, I guess, um, is on a more personal note. I think for a lot of us, it's easy to forget that you, aside from being a cabinet secretary, are also a real person <laughs> who goes to work every day and has those kind of experiences. And so I guess this question kind of touches on that. What, for you, has been the biggest joy of being so instrumental in the passage of such a historic health reform? But then on the flip side of that, what has been the biggest headache and struggle of working to constantly defend the reforms that you're working on? Well, I have, um, uh, in terms of the biggest joy, I mean, first of all, it is, it is just a thrill to be in this cabinet. I, I am a huge fan of our presidents, and I have to pinch myself on a regular basis <laughs> sometimes when I look around the room and think, you know, I'm not seeing a photograph. This is me. I'm in this room. <laughs> I have little out-of-body conversations with myself. Um, <laughs> but on a personal note, my dad was in the United States Congress in 1965. He sat on the Energy and Commerce Committee. He helped to write the Medicare legislation. He voted for the Medicare legislation. He's now 90 years old, and I'm here in this place administering Medicare, but also part of the next big generation. So that was a huge thrill to kind of come full circle. And I can tell you, he's pretty happy that he passed Medicare in the <laughs> uh, 60s. And I think we'll all be very happy about this. So to be part of this historic moment is, is incredibly special. Uh, you know, the biggest, I, I think, pain about it is to continue a debate a lot of times about issues that just aren't real and to continue to have to push back on what are intentional lies and mistruths. Um, that was frustrating during the course of the debate. It's still frustrating. But I remind myself that, you know, a lot of people have a lot at stake. Uh, some people are doing just fine and, frankly, making a lot of money off of the current system. Uh, their families are okay. Their loved ones are okay. They don't have to worry about this. And they risk a lot of financial changes with a new marketplace where 80 cents of every health dollar has to be spent on health-related costs, where if we're really successful in keeping people healthy in the first place, we won't be spending as much on acute care. We won't have as many sick people, in, and everybody will have access to the same coverage. So uh, pushing back on some of that day in and day out is a kind of pain in the neck. Um, but when I travel around the country, when I talk to moms and dads who say, I never thought I'd be able to have the peace of mind that my child who was born with a heart defect would ever get coverage in his lifetime. I have a daughter who now has health insurance. I'm a small business owner and I now can provide coverage for my employees and I keep the best people 
in my shop, that's a really good feeling, and that's really what this is all about. One person at a time, we're gonna make the change. Well, Secretary Sebelius, we all thank you so much for all the work that you do. Um, it's been great talking with you. Yeah, I mean, just thank you for your time, not only here, but the time that you spent working on it, and as a daughter who now has health insurance, uh, just a big resounding thank you from our generation and the two of us. Yes. Let's <laughs> well, give her our hands One final request. We really need you. We need your voices. We need your energy. We need your effort to make sure that this moment is not lost. Part of the moment is to make sure we have a president in 2012 and beyond who is committed to this plan. Part of it is to push back on the mistruths. So we have a Congress who wants to continue to move ahead. This is an important moment. Uh, when Social Security was passed, it was five years between the time that the taxes began being collected and the time the benefits went into place. There were numerous bills that went through Congress all the way to the president, were vetoed by the president to repeal Social Security. There were a bunch of court challenges that made their way through courts to declare it unconstitutional. But once the benefits were fully realized by the American people, that debate was over forever. So that's the moment we're in right now, and we need your help to make sure we never go back again. We only go forward. Thank you very much.